we follow the Spanish model in terms of the same kind of extraction systems they use in the Spanish model. That's right. what we have installed in the clubs around the UK to try and clear some of the air. Well, not clear some of the air, we clear all of the air. And it's uh, regenerated with fresh air on a regular basis. So like that, that's all we can say. All we can do is make it as safe as we possibly can and we follow a regulation that we foresee in other countries and what they've done in other clubs and in other models to make sure that we, we abide by what they're currently doing in Europe. Okay. Obviously, Amsterdam's a different kettle of fish, but yes. in Spain, they have a very similar system of what we're currently trying to operate under. Right, so if you're just tuning into Five Live and you think, oh, gosh, maybe with the US midterm elections, I haven't realised that they've just legalised cannabis in this country and they are having a good conversation about cannabis social clubs. No, that's not the case. It is still very much <laughs> illegal in this country <laughs> and the possession of the drug can get you five years in prison. But it is estimated that there are over 160 of these cannabis social clubs in the UK. Hardy Aldinza joins us right now, who's the Police and Crime Commissioner for Derbyshire and the National Lead on Drug Use. Uh, Hardy Al, very warm welcome to Five Live. Thank you. Why is a blind eye being turned to these clubs? Um, uh, it's interesting. I mean, I didn't even know about cannabis social clubs until about uh, six or seven weeks ago. Um, and what I understand is that the risk and threat that policing has to always think about appears not to have generated any action by police forces up and down the country against cannabis social clubs. They, and having been skeptical about them, I understand they are membership uh, organization. They have a strict regulation and uh, control of what they're doing. And it appears that if that's not creating a risk and threat to the public and others, and therefore, I don't think any of these kind of social schools have been um, targeted or raided by the police, wherever they, be, they are in the country. And as you say, they are publicly known about. You can find out about them on, um, on, um, on, 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 on the internet. Yeah, you don't need to be D.I. Tennyson to try and find one of these, by any stretch of the imagination, uh, hard they are. So, as a police and crime commissioner... Um, would you feel that any police and crime commissioner who allows there to be cannabis social clubs on their patch is effectively not doing their job and potentially not fit for purpose? Yeah, an interesting question, that one. Um, this is a... Police and crime commissioner has put set policy and the priorities. Operational delivery of policing is the chief constables who are advised by the National Police Chief Council about how they tackle all kinds of criminality. So it's up to individual chief constables to see how they do that. Um, so that is always a prioritizing that's going on. I would not want to condone any kind of criminality. And at the moment, cannabis possession and use is against the law. So I'm not wanting to sort of say that, oh, it's okay, free for all. I'm intrigued by the concept that they, cannabis social clubs do exist. They appear to have a membership, and from what I understand, 60% of members are using it for medicinal type purposes, and 40% are sort of more recreational users. But they seem to um, provide a way of actually, and I think there's no. I guess there's, there's no, no real way of knowing that, really. No, I mean, no, I, I don't, I don't know that. I'm no. just saying this is what I heard. So all I want to do. I don't want to condone any sort of criminality, but I do need to see how we can actually have an adult conversation about whether there is a place for cannabis social clubs and how we tackle issues through drug, drug use and demand. And we know that the police enforcement and the war on drugs you mentioned earlier, is that we're not winning the war on drugs. As we know with pro prohibition of alcohol, that didn't work. And as we know with tobacco, through education and regulation, we've had more success than actually leaving it free for all. Do, do you think it's then only a matter of time until we legalise cannabis? Do you um, think it's not an if, it's a when? Yeah, I mean, it, but I think there's some sort of move towards that, in my opinion. I mean, for example, the Home Secretary recently... Um, allowing um, cannabis oil being made available for people who have been suffering ill health, particularly young, young, young children that have been publicized with uh, epileptic fits and seizures, and that medicinal um, oil, uh, 
this oil is now being able to be prescribed um, uh, illegally. So okay. that begins to say, are there, do we need to distinguish the negative impact of herbal cannabis versus the positive impact? And is there a regulation and better control rather than leaving criminals to take commercial profit and also... Um, but you'd have to legalise all of it. Types of, uh, models of it. You'd have to legalise all of it, really, wouldn't you? Otherwise, they'd still leave quite a large part of the market yeah. for I mean, criminals to exploit. Yeah, I mean, that, that's right. It's, 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 that, that's, uh, that needs really exploring uh, further. But we've been exploring this. Hadiel, I mean, I know you said um, that we need, you know, an adult conversation, but this adult conversation has been going on seemingly for a decade plus. It's not as if there's been any lack of conversation about this. So uh, at some point, someone's going to have to do something. I mean, one of your colleagues, and I don't know if they're still the uh, uh, Police and Crime Commissioner uh, for North Wales, uh, Arfan Jones, is very clear. Yeah. Said, it, it, you know, they've lost... They've lost the war on, on drugs, and it will continue to fail unless there is a radical rethink about this. He, he has visited uh, some of these uh, uh, places. He's now calling for Spanish-style collectives. I mean, this is from an article just in yeah. August. Apparently, he's still uh, the PCC yeah. for, um, for yeah. North Wales. And, and he said, I support a legalised and regulated cannabis market with age restrictions and the personal cultivation of a certain number of plants. It has been clear for a very long time that the so-called war on drugs has failed. I'm sympathetic to the Spanish-style cannabis clubs, which grow their own cannabis for regulated consumption by their members. Now, that's a fellow police, crime and, uh, uh, police and crime commissioner saying what you're quite not willing to say. I mean, that's right. I'm the national lead for drugs. So my, my role is to sort of get a consensus across police and crime commissioners. What's the consensus, you think, at the moment? At the moment, uh, majority would be, I think, not for uh, this process uh, uh, generally. Uh, this idea of cannabis social clubs is a way of actually better uh, regulating and managing and sort of um, taking... Um, profit away from the criminals is being looked at. Arvin Jones and a number of other police are in the minority at the moment, but as the war on drugs continues not to make the difference in terms of stopping usage, demand, you mean fail. And supply, fail, yeah. failing, yeah. The, the sort of the interest in the views that Arvin Jones in North Wales um, and David Jameson in the West Midlands and others are saying that we should seriously consider is gaining more attention. Okay, and my, job, my yeah. job is to actually see how we can actually discuss that further and have a conversation in terms of how we progress this from just talking to actually looking at it in, in a more progressive way. Yeah, uh, Hadiel, pl please stay with us. AD is in Norfolk, got in contact with us. Uh, AD, thank you uh, for joining right. us. Um, okay. I'm, I'm very sorry to hear about the loss of your brother. Thank you. Which, which, I mean, God, the guy, he wasn't even 40 years old. And, and you, uh, sent, you sent a text to us, AD. Tell me what you put in that text. I basically said that I wish he'd had access to a cannabis club because um, I think, I firmly believe he'd still be alive today if he had. Why? Make, make the link for me if you can. Well, he was a regular cannabis user, social... Um, with his friends um, and, and happy and, you know, we, we, we had, he had his ups and downs, but it was only cannabis and that's all it was, that's all it ever was. Um, and then one particular evening, he was int introduced to, I think it was ketamine at the time, horse tranquilizer. Mm. Um, and then from that point on, I can list uh, a catalogue of horrors and thefts and imprisonment and, you know, he just derailed as a person um, and it, it was purely and simply because of the company he was keeping at that time that he got introduced to that because one thing about my brother he was a fun loving guy but he had no willpower mm. um, and I believe if he had a social club he would have in, he would enjoy his cannabis and then, like, like the, your guest said there was there's no other drugs in that other than cannabis so he would have been happy somewhere to go, somewhere to socialise, and I do firmly believe he wouldn't have gone down that road that he ended up on. 
Um, I think that's counter to what a lot of people will think, isn't it, Aidy? Because some people yeah. argue that cannabis is a gateway drug to other drugs. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. I mean, it, because it opens up doorways to other people. But if you're mingling with the people and you're socialising within that environment, I don't believe the other drugs are readily available. It, it, I mean, it all comes across when he goes when they go to the dealers and, well, I've, I've got some, but I've got this. Do you want to, you know, I can try a little bit of this, you can try a little bit of that, and That's then it, without the willpower, you just you, you just fall by the wayside. So it's not so much the drugs. I think this is a very interesting take on this, um, AD. It's not so much a drug, it's the company that you yeah. keep with the drugs. I believe so. I believe, I, I've, I've got friends that smoke it regularly and never, ever touched anything else. And uh, to be fair, honest, they don't even smoke uh, in the normal sense. Oh, right. yeah, 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 I know people like so, that. Yeah. And they've never dabbled. And I think it all, because some of these people that my brother went on the on the wrong path with have changed their life around and are living perfectly normal, healthy lives, married with families. Yeah. But he never, ever got out of that rut. And he could never get out of that rut. And eventually he, he went into remission. He was on... Um, I think methadone or something for years, and then someone, one of these crowd, asked him years later if they could, he could help them score, which he did, and he had a little bit of his own, and, and, and he died in his sleep oh, that night. AD, um, thank you for coming on to share um, your thoughts with us, and again, my deepest condolences. Awesome, thanks, thanks very much. Great show to help. Cheers, AD. Cheers, Cheers. Thanks a lot. Bye -bye. Richie, 